fools and nuns, chugs are rising with the mayfly, and the sun is shining down on the valley. Hope to be a fly fish to the day that I die. Spring has thawed out the long bitter winter. The water is clear and the skies are blue. I'm standing in the middle of the Beaver Kill River. I might even catch and release one or two. Well, some folks like horses, cats or dogs. Me, I like fishing with a rod and a fly. Yes, fishing is a time of mine. We're ready to start. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by winding my thread on my hook. And again, you're going to pull towards you and then wrap over it. And it's difficult with a, a long hook like this to wrap because the hook bends, okay? But we're just going to bear with it and we're going to wrap real fast and get that all the way down the body. So we got a nice base on our fly and again I'm holding my tag end at a 45 degree angle and it allows me to wind very fast and not have to even think about it. Um, and it makes a nice tight body on this fly. Oops. And I'm going to go all the way back to the bend and that's where we're going to put our tail. I'm going to straighten that hook in there. There we go. And my scissors are over there. Anyway. Uh-oh. Phone call. Phone call. Cut. 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 Okay. Um, where were we? Okay, I'm going to wind to the bend, cut, and trim. Now, I'm going to make a tail. So I, I just want a few of these fibers, but I want to line them up. So I'm going to have to take this, and I like to cut it as close to the base as I can, so that you don't have a lot of feathers monkeying around, or a lot of fur. And we're just going to put this inside the hackle pliers. 
or the hat hair stacker, I mean. And then we're going to tap this on our bench. Okay, we tapped it. Now the fiber should be all lined up nice and neat. We're going to pinch it. And that's our tail. Pull some of those loose fibers out. We're just going to put a little tail on there. Not, doesn't have to be really big um, and I like to leave quite a bit of that on there because it helps bulk up the body so we're going to pinch and wrap pinch wrap and pull up and then we're going to we don't want this to spin too much because it is deer hair so we're going to loosely wrap over that and then wrap it down and that will get all packed down when we put our dubbing on so I'm not too worried about that but now we're going to wrap over that back to the bend and there's our tail okay now we have to get a hackle in there to palmer over the body so I'm going to find a nice long one okay and I'm going to tie this in by the tip because I want the hackle fibers to get longer as it goes towards the front so we're going to tie it just take the tip of that hackle and wrap it in there nothing fancy there we go that's the palmer over the body okay and we can wrap all we want over that oops watch out for the hook that hook is sharp and it will break your line your tying thread now I'm gonna really wax this up good and get some wax on my fingers so that uh, there we go I'm going to put a lot of dubbing on. This is one of those flies that, you know, the dubbing companies love because you're going to use a lot of dubbing. And uh, you can you can tie this with any color you want. You could even use a green, greener color if you wanted to do, uh, uh, use this just as a, uh, say, like a grasshopper. And we're going to really put a lot of dubbing on here. We're really going to bulk this up because we want it to look like a big fat happy stonefly that just hatched. Has a nice yellowish color and is fat and happy and get ready to spawn and uh, lay eggs. So it's a real happy and some of these are actually orange. You can actually use an, an orangish color uh, on these. That, that's where you get into a stimulator is a more orangish in color just by nature, you know. Um, but I find this yellow is, is a good color. I like this color and many of the golden stoneflies I found, the giant stoneflies, have this color. Oh, this is what I like. This is what I'm sticking to. And again, we're tying Kurt's Killer Stonefly. And we're really going to beef up that body. Make a nice, nice body. When you get up to about the shoulder, shoulder of the hook here, right about in that area, that's where we're going to stop with our dubbing for now. Because what we're going to do is we're going to palmer this hackle over the body. So we're going to just wrap it and make a rib and try to make your segments fairly even. We're just going to wrap that hackle forward and then tie it off. And again when you're tying off you got to make sure you're wrapping around that that feather. You can't just leave that. Now this feather is pretty good. I could actually keep that on there and use that, but I, I'm not going to right now. You could actually use that to wrap around the shoulder after we put our hair on there. But what I'm going to do now is uh, actually I'm going to put in another another hackle because this is one we're going to wrap forward. And this one can be tied normally using the, the base of the feather. So we're going to clip that right there. And this one, uh, I'll show you what we're going to do with it later, but right now we're going to clip the two sides off so that we got little nubs to tie on. And I'm just going to tie this on, okay? 
I'm not going to wrap it yet. I'm just going to tie that on. Nice. Okay. Now we're going to do our hair trick. So I have my hair here. I'm going to take out a, a good, good size clump, maybe the size of a pencil. Okay. I'm going to pull it right out of there. And then I'm going to nip it as close to the body as I can of the, the skin. So now I have all this, this hair. And this is a nice messy fly to tie. So we're going to kind of get some of the loose dubbing out of there. We don't want that on there. See all that little fluffy stuff that's in there? Get rid of that. Now we're going to place this in our hair stacker. We're going to place this in the hair stacker. Get the tips in there nice and even. Once you put them in there, you're going to tap that on the table. And that's going to line the fibers up nice and neat. Okay. Pretty good. And again, this is our, our wing. And we want this to extend past the body. Okay. So our measuring, if it was a stimulator, it would be right about there. But to make a stone fly, we want it to extend over the body, so I'm going to measure that. Pull out the shorter ones. I'm going to measure that right there. And that's pretty good. I'm using as much of that as I can. I'm going to nip it off kind of even. And then I'm going to loosely wrap and pull up. And then don't let go until you're sure it's on there because it's deer hair and it will fluff up on you okay see how it goes but that's our wing okay so we're gonna we're gonna actually wind wind a hackle over that but now we need some more dubbing when I do it there it is I need to make the thorax which is another important part of this insect they have a fairly beefy head and thorax body where the where the legs come out of. So we're going to put some more dubbing on there. We're going to pull the wing down and then wrap. And we're going to use a bunch of dubbing here. And it's important that you make a nice head here because what we're going to be doing is is wrapping our other grizzly hackle over this to imitate the legs and the antennae okay maybe a little more well a little more a lot more make a nice big thorax there we go right up to the eye of the hook okay some of these deer, deer here don't want to stay back. So, now we have our hackle here. I'm going to find my favorite hackle pliers. Clamp that on there. And I'm going to wrap three or four times around the shoulder right here where the wings, where the wing starts. I want to have several wraps. And then I'm going to palmer this again over the thorax okay so you can see the yellow under it and wrap right up to the eye and then I'm going to tie off okay so this is a stonefly not a stimulator and I don't want anybody writing me saying well that's a stimulator it's not a stimulator it was tied to imitate a particular insect which was the stonefly I actually took insects to copy so that doesn't make it a stimulator. A stimulator is one that's just a goofy bug to stimulate something. Fish into feeding perhaps. But this is Kurt's Killer Stonefly. Look at that. Isn't that a beauty? New York City has the world's largest unfiltered water supply. Right now, the natural gas industry wants to drill in our watersheds.
The process is called hydraulic fracturing. It uses over 900 chemicals injected under the ground, combined with explosives that cause many earthquakes to extract the gas. But the process hasn't been proven safe. Watersheds across the nation have been contaminated with plastics, carcinogens, mutagens, and endocrine-disrupting chemicals, and with explosive natural gas. Whoa! This cannot be allowed to happen here. Join Scott Stringer, Manhattan Borough President's Kill the Drill campaign. Because we can't drink natural gas. And because there's no New York without New York water. And that to me is the most alarming environmental news I've heard in a long time. And makes this the number one environmental crisis that we face in the city. A message from Scott Stringer, Manhattan Borough President, and WaterUnderAttack.com. I like the idea that this particular activity is isolated from the Federal Clean Water Act when every other activity is still under the restrictions and observations of the Federal Clean Water Act. So to us it just doesn't make any sense, particularly when we have these reports that show toxic fluids are, sh are showing up in these injection activities and the consequences of those toxic fluids are having uh, adverse circumstances inflicted upon innocent people. And we have a number of reports ourselves on that. So this is just something that we're trying to deal with in the context of the legislation that uh, Diane DeJet talked about a little while ago. Um, we uh, understand that uh, several of the witnesses claim that there is no evidence. Some people, a lot of people claim that there's no evidence that fracking has caused water contamination. But we have seen that there is water contamination in a number of places. And I mentioned those places before. Alabama, Arkansas, Colorado, Texas. I had a call yesterday from a man in Texas that uh, was talking about uh, the impact of these uh, toxic chemicals on his family and how it had contaminated his water supply. So I, I, uh, th that's why we're trying to deal with this issue. And I wanted to ask Mr. Appleton if you're aware of any of the independent empirical research that has been conducted that uh, in any way suggests that fracking does not pose a risk to water supply. Is there any proof out there? Well, anytime you put chemicals like you're used in fracking into the environment, it's a risk to water supply if they're not properly regulated. There's also a problem that in states like New York, they don't require incidents uh, to be reported on a systematic basis, so you can't really determine this issue either way. For decades, the oil and gas industry has lobbied to create a regulatory climate which has paved the way for the current drilling boom. Back in 2000, after the Bush-Cheney election, there was a dramatic acceleration in drilling activity. Both had received large contributions from oil and gas interests, and the vice president had been the chief executive of Halliburton, a major player in the drilling industry. Ladies and 
meeting the needs of our growing economy also means expanding our domestic production of oil and natural gas, which are vital fuels for transportation, electricity, and manufacturing. Whatever our hopes for developing alternative sources and for conserving energy, and that's part of our plan. The reality is that fossil fuels supply virtually 100% of our transportation needs below. Many Democrats fought the Bush-Cheney energy policies. They felt they were shut out of the process of developing the nation's approach to energy. This administration is a gas and oil administration, frankly, and, and so they're, they're wedded to an old policy. They're wedded to a 20th century policy when we need a 21st century policy. You have the Bush administration. You have two oil men at the very top, and they aren't sympathetic. They're making very serious mistakes because they've talked to themselves and the energy companies and only themselves and the energy companies. We don't know what other provisions may have been added in, uh, special interest provisions that, that are easy to add in when you're writing one of these bills in secret. In 2005, the administration's energy bill passed with support from members of both political parties. It provided the gas and oil industry with billions of dollars in subsidies, tax breaks, and research money. 65% of the current subsidies go to gas and oil, and you have this imbalance. We ought to have 65% or more, 80% ought to be going to alternative renewable technology, to energy efficiency. The energy bill makes practical reforms to the oil and gas permitting process to encourage new exploration. After years of debate and division, Congress passed a good bill. $20 there she is. <laughs> we call it our new neighbor, neighbor 907. We have 70 acres here, and I can't convince them that they need to drill somewhere besides 200 feet from our house. The boom is happening all over the country. There's oil and gas operations in 32 states right now, but the Rocky Mountain states are really seeing the vast majority of the expansion. This will be the gate to enter into my property. The old company had me completely locked out. A split estate situation is when somebody who owns the surface of their land does not own the resources that are underneath their land. Whoever owns the surface probably can't control what happens on their own property. You feel so helpless, you know. My great-grandfather is buried here. They totally wiped out the cemetery. But we have a very large emphasis about being a good neighbor, about doing the things that you would do in your neighborhood with your next door neighbor. We were in bed actually sleeping, and then our son called. He said that the well was on fire. See all them bubbles on that water up there, Bob? Jesus, yeah. That's all gas coming up. Yeah, let's go and light it. Oh, yeah, it burns. They don't tell you everything that's in a product. You may only get 5% of what's in that product, and the rest of it is proprietary, or they just don't give it. Every single fracking company, they sell that theirs is the best product. It would be like um, divulging why your chocolate is better than somebody else's chocolate, because you have those ingredients. It's unbelievable that someone says toxic. That stuff in the pit is not hazardous and not toxic. I have fracking fluid taken right out of a fracking truck. I've had it in my mouth, I've tasted it, and I'm just fine. Well, around 50% of the chemicals cause such things as kidney damage, cardiovascular problems. This is before any problems in it, before we lived in Rifle. And then has everything changed? There's no question that people are getting sick from oil and gas exploration throughout the United States. And when you ask them what their symptoms are, it's the same in one area as it is in another area. Today, we have close to 5,000 wells that have been drilled. That's just in the northwestern area. And if you look down the road uh, 15 years and you start contemplating 60,000 wells, what does that do?
The hills are alive with the sound of music. <laughs>